All right, welcome back. Now let's talk about a really, really critical uh, topic to understand networking, to understand how the internet works and big corporate networks and provider networks work. That is um, IP subnetting. We're going to be, we talked in the, the last video about how packets are constructed and in this video we'll talk about how they get routed around. Um, just a housekeeping note in this video, more than in um, a lot of other videos, I'm going to read from the slides because I've worded things fairly specifically. Um, and I've um, kind of laid out an example through these slides. So we'll be going over um, kind of the slides with specific work wording and then I'll expound there. Let's get started. So the creators of IP uh, came up with a really clever way for us to divide addresses into a couple parts. And we call these parts the network portion of the address and the host portion of the address. And the network portion of the address uh, specifies what uh, network the, the particular group of devices in, is in. Kind of like a, a zip code. And the host portion of the address specifies the actual unique number uh, for that given network device. That's kind of like the, the actual street address. So uh, subnets are incredibly useful as um, they allow us to route traffic logically to a network rather than having to know the specific information for each host on that network. So rather than having a, a table where we, where we have to say this host is here and this host is here and this host is here and just this giant massive table and at internet scale that could be billions of devices perhaps, we can say this group of addresses is over this way and this group of addresses is over this way. And then what we can actually do is summarize those addresses into bigger, bigger groups. So this is kind of skipping ahead, but we can say this provider's address space, this internet service provider has a big block of address space. If you want to get to all their customers, they're over here and so on and so forth. I like to use the analogy um, of the post office. So the, the network would be the, the zip code. And, and for most mail routing uh, you know, across the country, all the, the postal delivery people care about is the zip code. They're just trying to get that letter that you sent closer to the zip code. And that could be a particular post uh, substation at that zip code. And then the only people who actually care about the street address are the mail carriers at that post station who have to take that letter and deliver to the specific address. So everybody else is just working to get it to that zip code. So a zip code in that way is like an, the network portion of the address. It kind of summarizes areas of subscribers. And in fact, as we know, the street address can be the same as long as it's in a different zip code. So you can have a, a five main street in every city in America, as long as the zip code's different. Same with host addresses. <clears throat> Let's talk about uh, subnet rules. All routers and devices that use IP within their network software are programmed to follow some rules, and this makes this whole thing work. It's a part of the IP protocol. One of those rules is uh, if the device I would like to talk to is in my subnet, I can encapsulate my layer 3 packet with a layer 2 header, so put that layer 2 portion on there, and send it directly to that device. So I can send a, create a frame that goes straight to that end device or piece of network equipment. But if the device I would like to talk to is not in my subnet, I must use a router to talk to that other device. Therefore, I must construct a layer 2 header that has the information for my next hop router, often for a computer, that would be the default gateway, and prepend it to my packet. So I can't talk directly with that device if it's not in my subnet. I have to talk to some sort of a router. And note that could be any device that performs the routing function like a, a firewall or 
a layer three switch or something like that. Let's talk about subnet notation, how we represent subnets. So the slash 24 at the end of this address here is called the subnet mask. And we write those subnet masks in a few different ways and you'll see uh, just about all of them. Uh, it specifies which portion of the address refers to the network and which portion refers to the host. So which portion of this address right here is network and host? And you can see we've already done the underlining here for a slash 24. We're gonna go through this math and figure what all that means. Since an IP address contains 32 bits, we talked about that last uh, video, the number in the subnet mask tells us how many of those bits are part of the network portion of the address. Okay, so the subnet mask says how many of the 32 bits specify the network, and then we assume that the rest are left over for the host. So let's convert this uh, IP address back to binary, because we know that's what these computers and routers really understand. They understand uh, ones and zeros as a coded into light or electricity. So there it is right there. We've converted 192.168.11.22 into the corresponding binary and kept the color scheme there. So we're saying out of the 32 bytes in this address, so there's 32 ones and zeros in, in here for readability, we broke them up into blocks of eight. And the first 24 of those bits, and sorry, this, this is a typo right here. This should say out of the 32 bits in this IP address, I'll change that. The first 24 are part of the network portion of the address, and the last eight bits are for the host. So 24 bits for the network portion, eight for the host. So 24 here refers to these 24 bits in the network portion of the address. Let's talk about the subnet mask and how that works. So for each bit in the IP, so this is the IP address right here. We just looked at that. We will put a one, a binary one, if it is part of the network portion of the address, and a zero if it is part of the host portion of the address, and that will be our subnet mask. So these bits down here correspond up to the bits of the address. One means network, zero means host. And they'll always be contiguous like that. So you'll have all ones in a, in a row and then zeros here. So you'll never see a situation like you have above here where one zero one zero for the subnet mask it's one 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 and then zero 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 and that specifies how much of this IP address is part of the network portion. So 24 bits are part of the network portion of the address. So just as we represented the uh, IP address in decimal notation, base 10, so this, this is what we like to see. Let's write the subnet mask in the same way. So IP address, this is the same as last slide, converts to 11.22. The subnet mask, ones, 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 and zeros, convert to 255.255.255.0. This is the same as slash 24 is the same as 255, 255, 255, 0. Because there are 24 ones in the subnet mask, we can write the subnet as we did above or abbreviate it to slash 24. In slash 24, we call a CIDR uh, notation, classless interdomain routing notation, that little abbreviated format there. In the old days, um, there were three subnet lengths or classes that were mapped to three different large groups of IP addresses. Class A, Class B, and Class C. And I, I wrote them all out here, I won't repeat them all. But the class of your address was assumed based on the range. So if you were a one dot something, you were a Class A, and you know, uh, maybe a 130, you were a Class B, and so on and so forth. But this, what we call the classful method of subnetting, lacked a ton of flexibility. That 
didn't work for long because we really needed to create subnets of different sizes so we can have different size uh, host pools here so we could have a, a group of a, a really large subnet with a lot of hosts or or a little small subnet with just a few hosts anyhow we wanted variable sizes and we wanted to be able to use a larger subnet to represent multiple smaller subnets within it so now we always specify the subnet explicitly we never assume that it's going to be a class a or a class b or a class c i included that because that's kind of part of the networking lore network history but nowadays we're classless we don't assume anything we always use a subnet mask to tell us the the length of the network portion of the address so let's talk about an example where we want to talk to a device outside of our subnet. So in this case, 192.168.11.22 wants to send packets to 192.168.33.44. So we don't know 33.44 subnet because we can't see its configuration, right? That device might be owned by somebody else. It may own, be owned by Google or Microsoft or Apple, one of their servers. So we can't know their configuration, but we do know our configuration. We know our subnet mask, which means we can figure out who is in our subnet, what, what range of addresses would be in our subnet, and what range of addresses wouldn't. If, if the address was within our subnet, the other address, that means we could talk directly to it. We just put a layer two header in there that goes directly to that device. But if it's outside of our subnet, we couldn't do that. We talked about that before. We'd have to talk to an intermediary host like a router, our default gateway. So 192.168.11 is the network portion of the address. And here it is written in binary. Now remember, the last eight bits are available for the host portion, for IP addresses. So the lowest, so if we zeroed all that out in binary, we'd have 11.0. That would be the lowest address we could use. If we put all ones here, the highest address we could use would be the 255 address. So that is the range of addresses that is now available to us within our subnet. A little bit more on this. Uh, we're going to exclude the .0 address. We're going to reserve that for what we call the network address. It's the address that describes the network. And the 255 address, the highest in the range, is set aside as the broadcast address if we want to send a broadcast packet out. Now remember, this doesn't always have to be the 0 or the 255. They're just always the lowest and the highest in the range. So depending on how we do our subnets, those numbers could change. But in our case, that's 0 0.255. So now the list of IP addresses on our subnet is between 192.168.11.1 and 192.168.11.254. This means that 33.44 is not in our subnet. It is outside of that range of addresses. So we have a host that we want to talk to that's outside of our subnet. So earlier we said, remember the rule, if the device I would like to talk to is not in my subnet, I must use a router to talk to the other device. Little uh, parentheses here. This could be a bunch of other routers. This could be a series of other routers that we have to talk to, but we know we have to talk to at least one router to get us into that subnet. So to connect to, oops, 192.168.33.44, we need to forward our packet to a router. Because 192.168.11.22 is a PC in our example, we know of one router. We've used this term before. Uh, it can be configured either manually, you can put it in as your sysadmin can do it, or you can do it, or what often happens, what is most common, is we uh, give that information out dynamically via DHCP, and it's called our default gateway. So, the default, let's see, so in this case, the default gateway we're given is the 11.1 .1 address, the lowest in the subnet. 
And like we say here, the default gateway is given the special role of being the router we use when a device needs to send traffic outside of its network. Each um, piece of you know client network here, like a like a server or a, or a workstation, laptop, desktop, mobile phone, they all have a, a spot in there for a default gateway. So they get that configured. That's how they talk outside their subnet. So to send traffic between subnets, we construct a packet with a layer two destination of our default gateway. That's represented as BB right here. That would actually be a MAC address, but we're gonna abbreviate here to BB. And a layer three destination of our final, of the IP address right here. Our final destination, which is the IP. So back to the table we saw in video two, my MAC address, AA, your MAC address, BB, that's our default gateways address. The IP address, however, is my source and the final destination, destination. And they're all color coded here. So we construct that packet, we send it off now for the second hub. When the default gateway, which is our router, gets the packet, it sees the packet is, is destined for itself based on the layer two destination. So it removes this device in the middle here, removes the layer two header. We're done with that header. It then consults a table of destinations, calls it its routing table and sees if it has any path to 192.168.33.44. And in our example, it does. So we're gonna make this really easy. So it has a direct path to that subnet. It has a connection directly to 192.168.33, that subnet. That's great. So the router then decides to add a new layer two header to the packet. Remember, we discarded the old layer two header with new source and destination MAC addresses and forwards it onto the destination. So you can see in this little matrix here, the MAC addresses have changed, the IP addresses have not. IP addresses are used for global delivery throughout the network. MAC addresses change hop for hop. And again, we're using our MAC address abbreviations. Success. So our packet has made it to its destination. Uh, we refer to it as a packet here because the L2 portion changed along the way, but the layer three portion of the packet, source and destination IPs, and everything else in the packet stayed the same. Now we're oversimplifying here a little bit. That's not always how it works. And there's, there's some routers and switches that do make small modifications to the packet, but that's how it works with the address information. At least the layer three source and destination stay the same again for the most part, but for our example, it's valid. And then, um, the Mac addresses change at each hop. So we can say AA to BB, remove the layer two header, CC to DD. That's great. So in summary, the process of checking, discarding, and then replacing the layer two header at each op can be and is repeated to deliver a packet safely, hopefully, hopefully it's carried safely to the ultimate layer three destination, the destination IP address, whether that be another computer or a server out there on the internet. This process is just repeated layer two header, check it, replace it, send it on to the next device, to the next device, to the next device, each router along the way in what is hopefully the best path to that device, whatever that is kind of a loaded statement, but whatever that best, best path is to finally make it to its destination here. All right. So that's a basic intro to uh, IP subnetting, a fascinating topic and at the core really of our understanding of networking.